Good morning. Good morning. And welcome. It's wonderful to see each and every one of you. Those of you who are joining us online, this service is streamed, live streaming online. It is also posted, so if you'd like to share it with family or friends, it can be found both on our website and YouTube. I'm Vance Polly. I'm the pastor of Sunrise Presbyterian Church, and as you heard, we are welcoming people to in-person worship as well. We follow good, safe protocols, so if you're interested in coming and being part of worship, it's something that we're trying to manage and monitor in these unusual times. Your worship leaders uh, this morning include Reese Smith, Matthew Parker, Heidi and Kent Kenyon, and Eric Lavender. The bulletin for this morning's service uh, was emailed to many of you. It can be found online as well. However, it is not necessary for full participation in the worship service. This is that time of the year as we look between Easter and as we move towards the summer season. A couple of notes as we try to imagine life returning to more normal. We're looking at beginning to bring about more in-person events. One of the things we will do, whether with an adult Sunday school class, a, the women's evening Bible study, uh, our men's prayer breakfast, in each of those cases, we will look at the safest and the best way to bring that back. Um, we're hoping with the men's prayer breakfast to do that in the next month or two, and we'll put notices about that. I know that the women's evening Bible study is going to try to do some in person as well and that's in May that they're looking forward towards it but in all cases that is Bible study, Sunday school, we will continue to live stream and we're going to do that with the worship service so the options are always there we're just expanding the options. Friends Technology allows us to share worship in real time, whether physically in, pre in person or whether sharing live streaming online. May we greet one another in spirit. May the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Amen.
Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come, Come into, into God's, God's presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It, it is God, God that made us, and we are his. We are God's people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter God's gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to God. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. God's steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, on this day we give you thanks. Thanks for your church. Thanks for this church. Thanks for those who surround us, be they family or friends, for the fellowship we have, the fellowship with our family of faith, our brothers and sisters. Lord, you have given us so much. And this day we come to worship you we ask that you clear our minds of any concerns or anxiety so that we may truly be here this morning to fill ourselves with your spirit. Lord, make us prayerful, make us thankful, and make us sons and daughters who are able to show our love to you. We pray this and all things in the name of your Son and our beloved Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we come together this day to worship God, it's important that we do so with truth in our hearts, truth about who we are, truth about our shortcomings and our flaws. This is our opportunity to be honest with ourselves and with God. Let us do that now in one voice. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought word and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone we have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves in your great mercy forgive what we have been help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. You just 
choose the humble and raise them high. You choose the weak, make them strong. You heal our brokenness inside and give us life. The same love that set the captives free. The same love that opened eyes to see. He's calling us all by name. You are calling us all by name. The same God that spread the heavens wide. The same God that was crucified is calling us all by name. You are calling us all by name. You take the faithless one. Brothers and sisters, the news is good. We are indeed each called by name, by a God filled with love and grace, whose mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. In Christ we are forgiven. Amen. Alleluia.
The first scripture lesson is from the prophet Jeremiah, and it's a promise, promise fulfilled, and that is God's renewal of a relationship, but taking it to a place it had never been before. This is the promise to the people of Israel that that relationship that God has so long sought with them will occur and it's going to occur in a way that will amaze and surprise them. The prophet Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, beginning with the 31st verse. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Speak be to God. God. John, a wonderful and very familiar passage about the very nature of love, and I want you to listen carefully to the imagery. The word love here is the agape love, and we'll reflect on that a little bit more in the message. But as you hear both beloved and love, it is that love that is deep and transcendent and self-sacrificing. 1 John, the fourth chapter, beginning with the seventh verse. 
Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. Beloved, since we love, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us bow together in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Before I move on into the sermon, I realize I left the book that I want to refer to sitting over at the side, so I'm going to walk off screen and return. I'd like to begin with the two scripture lessons and the way in which those are interconnected one with the other. As I mentioned, Jeremiah is referring to not just a reclaiming of the covenant that God had established with the people of Israel, but taking it to a new place. If you remember a little bit of the history of God's faithfulness with the people, first, calling Abram, that is Abraham and Sarah, to leave their homeland, to go to a new place, to bring with their very family the good news and the blessing of God's relationship with them. It was a special and a unique relationship. And yet, watching human nature, we watch people try to be in control. So often we think about it in terms of simply sinning and disobedience. But at the heart of it, it's wanting to be in control. I mentioned earlier that the men's group is hoping to get back together for the breakfast and the devotional time. One of the themes that I would repeat almost weekly to the men, and that included all of us sitting around the table, was the need to recognize that we want to control things that we ought not to and that we need to let go and turn that control over. And as I look around the congregation now, several of the men who regularly attend the men's group are sitting here and it has been a long time since we've been together sharing that news. And uh, the family members in our lives desperately need us to get together again and renew that reminder that so much of what we do as human nature is trying to take control, the control that belongs to God, and to exercise it ourselves. That's that turning from God. And so the journey continued to the point where the people of Israel sojourn in Egypt. God brings them out with the Exodus, reestablishes that relationship and their place in their homeland, and yet they continue to turn. The turning from God is that of trying to take control and not allow God to be in control. And so the Babylonian exile occurred. That's what Jeremiah is referring to. The homecoming from having been taken, literally ripped from your homeland into a foreign land. And it's in that context that God says, I will establish a new covenant. Not like the ones you've known before, but one that is inside of you. A relationship. One that's on your heart. We hear in 1 John language that both surrounds it and connects us in a different way. Because the word love there that's used is agape love. It was intentionally chosen. It's a Greek word for a love that's different than simply family love or romantic love. 
This love is self-sacrificing. It's wholehearted. And so if you hear that language again, I want you to hold that as we begin to reflect on the theme of the message today. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us. And his love is perfected in us. That's a special love. It's one that reaches out in a remarkable way. And it's one that builds relationships and community in a different way. You may recall the first time you were introduced to William Golding's 1954 novel, The Lord of the Flies. I'm just going to go for a show of hands, the people here. How many people had that book assigned in high school or elsewhere, The Lord of the Flies? And if you read it, you were probably disturbed by its take on human nature. And yet, sadly, most of us just accepted that as an obvious reality. It is a dark story about British schoolboys that were marooned on a Pacific island. Their plane had gone down, and there were no adults around, so they were left to their own devices. By the time they're rescued, three of their number, three of the boys, had died. The rescue party that came looked rather sad and thinking, you know, British schoolboys ought to have done better than this. I think the phrase used should have had a better showing. Interestingly, and I picked this up reading more of the background material, William Golding actually decided to write the book because he read a story, a fictional story, about marooned schoolboys on an island that was very positive. And William Golding was a schoolmaster. And he looked at his wife and said, I need to write a real story about the way these kids would act on an island. Should I do that? And evidently she nodded yes, and he wrote it. The events a Lord of the Flies never happened. It's a fictional story. Its popularity demonstrates how much everybody recognized that cynical take on human nature. And I want you to hold that for a moment because I want to tell you a story about a real Lord of the Flies event and it's a positive message if any of you read my prayer last Monday it was an invitation to a hopeful and an amazing story but first some background information there's a sense of this longing for the perfect community a phrase that's used for that is utopia the ideal the idyllic type of community, one that is perfect in the way in which people work together. And most of us look at it and go, that will never happen. Thomas More wrote the book Utopia as a way of reflecting on something that was hopeful but highly unlikely. In fact, he's the one that pulled that word into the English language. It's a Greek word. And interestingly, it kind of has two meanings. Utopia can mean no place or a good place. And there's something about the distance between those two definitions that drew Thomas More to the word utopia. The real Lord of the Flies. Rutger Bergman is a Dutch historian, and he remembers having Lord of the Flies assigned to him. It was an international bestseller. He never questioned its view on human nature until recent research began to challenge the assumptions that lie behind it, the ones that we all embrace about left to our own devices, it's not going to go well. That's kind of the heart of Calvinism. 
So across various fields in the last two decades, there's been this emerging perspective that in fact, working together, cooperative instincts are at the heart of who we are. In fact, it is something very special about human nature and it challenges those underlying assumptions that have been accepted from the book, The Lord of the Flies. Let me share with you just a quick snippet of some of that research. There's a book that's been published, it's the one I walked off screen to pick up, entitled Blueprint, The Evolutionary Origins of a Good Society. And the author spends time going through a good deal of the recent research. From the book jacket, here's what's said about the book and it really captures the whole spirit of this new research from the book jacket. For too long, scientists have focused on the dark side of our biological heritage. That is our capacity for aggression, cruelty, prejudice, and self-interest. But natural selection has given us a suite of beneficial social features, including our capacity for love, friendship, cooperation, and learning. Beneath all our intentions, all our various inventions, our tools and farms and machines and cities and nations, we carry with us an innate proclivity to make a good society. And let me share with you the suite of the social pieces that we all inherit. The capacity to have and recognize individual identity, love for partners and offspring, friendship, social networks, cooperation, a preference for one's own group, that is, that you bond together, a mild hierarchy, that is, there's a sense of working together in an orderly manner, social learning and teaching. Bergman started to search to see if in fact there was a real Lord of the Flies. He knew of now two different stories that were competing. One that was positive, one that purported to be realistic about human nature. And the answer that he found was yes. In that research, he discovered that in fact, six boys were marooned on a Pacific island. Now, they grew up on a Pacific island, they were at a boarding school, and they got bored. And they were frustrated. And they decided that uh, they would try to go home, or at least get away from the boarding school and the island they were on. So they gathered up some bananas, didn't even bring a compass, absconded with a fishing boat and took off. Um, it was kind of a Gill Gilligan's Island number. A storm came up and they were incapacitated at sea for eight days. They gathered a few fish, but as really their strength was waning, they spotted an island. That's a kind way of putting it. It was a outcrop of rock, a deserted island. And the ship, the boat, crashed on the rocks and they were left on the island, all six of them. And they began to build a life there, not knowing when they would be spotted or when they might be rescued. First fishing right there at the ocean, then as they began to gather some strength, they climbed the cliffs and got up to the top of the island, at which point they found chickens. And they looked around and it was a deserted island. The backstory on the island is it had been inhabited, but all of its original inhabitants had been taken in 1863 
by a slave ship. And there were no more human beings there. It was just literally abandoned. But there was animals, domesticated animals there. So they built huts, built a fire, and built a life together. This went on for 15 months. They talked about their life together after they were rescued. And they were asked how they managed with competition, six boys together. And they said, well, you know, yes, there'd be arguments. Sometimes somebody would get a little unruly and we'd sort of push back and say, okay, get a hold of yourself. Others said, you know, there were times I'd walk to the other end of the island just for a little time out. So, the rescue. The gentleman who spotted them was in himself in a fishing boat. And as he came by the island, he spotted some huts and some clearing. And so he came closer to look, at which point one of the boys dove into the water and started swimming out. And pretty soon all of them were coming out to the boat, clambered on aboard his boat, and gave their story. Now that was a pretty unlikely story. So he radioed back to the island with the boarding school and they checked the records and they said, after about a half an hour got back to him and said, you mean you found them? We had funerals for all of them. We figured they were lost. So he brought them back to the island that they had left from. The story goes, they were arrested because they had stolen a boat. The ship captain paid off the owner of the boat, just simply said, let me cover that cost. He came from a family of some resources and took care of that. And what's interesting is the unfolding of the story. Not just simply the time on the island, but each of their lives. One of the young boys that was on that island became a lifelong friend of the sea captain, and they worked together for years. Bergman not only read the story, he went and met the people and interviewed. It turns out the Australian television network had actually done a special on them back in the 1960s. And so it was around, but it was tucked in a corner. The real Lord of the Flies is a story of cooperation and love and care and support. And each of those young men went on to live notable lives. One of them became a priest. But each of them carried with them the experience of cooperative living, of showing love to each other and supporting one another. Yes, some of it comes from their background and the families that they came from, the society that they lived in, where people knew they needed to cooperate with each other. But you see, friends, the good news for us is that not only are there these stories that illustrate that we ought to love one another, but that it is actually part of our nature. The sad reality is that we have focused on and emphasized the broken side of our lives, the aggression, the heavy competition, the anger, and the hatred. And I'm not just talking about in recent months or years. I'm talking about for generations, we have focused on that broken side of our nature and not recognized that God has planted within each and every one of us a goodness and a caring and a love to be nurtured. So when the statement is made from the scriptures that the way we see God is in the expression of love, we do not see God face to face except in the way in which we treat each other. So often we talk about, look at the person next to you, where there sits a child of God. Look into their eyes and recognize that God's love and grace is in your life. That's the good news. 
And in fact, thankfully, even the sciences are recognizing that it is something intrinsic to us. The book, Blueprint, does collect a great deal of recent research that's more and more showing that that's part of our human nature. And to me, it was remarkable news. I heard the interview with the Dutch historian, and needless to say, it caught my attention. I've been working in my mind on this for several weeks, saying, what a remarkable story. What a story that is timely and needed. So I commission you to look around and to recognize the goodness in the people around you. Lift it up. Call it out. Share it. And show it. Amen. enter into our ministry of prayer, I invite you to 
text in any requests that you might have using the phone number that's here in front of me, 843-437-4239. For those who are in in-person worship, you may speak the names of those whom you'd like held up in prayer, and as always, we lift them up from the silence of our hearts. Let us join our hearts together in prayer. Most holy and gracious God, we come to you in full trust and confidence for a love that claims us, that draws us near, that transforms us. A love that is given all for us. A love that is an example of how we are to treat and to care for one another. The New Testament used the word agape, a self-giving, self-sacrificing love, a love that cares for the other as much as one cares for themselves, if not more. And so it is that we reach out with prayers of love and care, lifting up those in special need of your love, your support, your care. Our prayers reach out around the world to those whom we'll never meet and never know by name, who are in desperate need of that support. And with our prayers goes as well that request, that dedication on our part to do what you would have us do, Lord. Whatever we might do that can support and help, you know better than we do what it is that we ought to do. We lift to you the names of those that we do know, loved ones, families, friends. We lift to you Roger, Gaynor, Susan, Bernard. We lift to you Sherry Eppelsheimer and her whole family, Meredith. Ellis, Rob, each and every person whose names have been spoken and those that have been lifted from the silence of our hearts feel the care and the comfort and the strength that flows from you, most gracious God. May they know how near and dear you are and how much you care. And so we offer this prayer in full trust and confidence in the name of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Friends, may we now continue giving thanks for all that God has done in our lives. May we support the ministry of Sunrise, its mission reaching out with good news to the world. Whether you're here in person and bringing your offerings forward, whether you mail them or give them online, in all ways we are dedicating these gifts to the glory of God as we rededicate our lives in service to the risen Lord. Let us continue worshiping God with our gifts, our offerings, and our tithes. Let 
Most gracious God, receive these gifts as tokens of our devotion. Take and use us that we might be witnesses to your goodness and grace. For here and now we rededicate our lives in service. And so we make this dedication in the name of the one who has taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, friends, go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak and help the suffering. Honor everyone. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.